Hey, welcome to the study hall for July 25th. If you have just arrived, we have some good material left over from last time on boldface problems in critical reasoning. So that is going to be our topic for today. And then if time permits, which most likely time will not permit, but if time permits, we can jump into <coughs> another set of critical reasoning thingies as well. So we already went over the whole rules part. So to go, it's time to go ahead and get cracking on these problems. Again, here's the here's the administrative stuff one more time, just in case you, you missed it. Uh, when we say give me a smiley face, those are found here. Find your name, look underneath it, you should see a menu of faces. And when you get a multiple choice problem, please pick the answer that is here, and please, please do not post your answer in the chat box. Thank you. And lastly, copyright disclaimer. These problems are copyright GMAC. They are from the free GMAT prep software. So these we can distribute because this software is free. We cannot use official guide problems because the official guide is not free. So. There's your copyright disclaimer. All right, with that said, let's take a look at a problem. How about this? Let's see. Let's look at this one. Okay, and before you start working this, let, let's just have a quick conversation here about time. How long should you allow yourself for something like this? Mm -hmm. People are saying two minutes. Someone is saying less than two. Um, yeah, more than two minutes is what you're going to want to say. All right. So we'll come back to this problem here in a second. But make sure that you guys are on board with the common sense here. Like two minutes or so is about an average time for a critical reasoning problem. I mean, some of the problem types are faster, like sentence correction probably should take a little bit less time than that. But the most important thing that you can know about timing is that you should, and this is total common sense, but again, one thing about this whole academic testing thing is that common sense is sometimes in short supply, is that <laughs> you should not try to take the average amount of time on every single task. And the averages are averages. So what that means is, you know, if a problem is long, then you should allow more than the average time. If a problem is short, then you should allow less than the average time. I mean, it's really like time management with anything else. I mean, if you, like, the analogy that I normally use here is if you, like, are on a painting crew and you normally paint houses in an average of four hours, then if you have to paint a gigantic, huge mansion, then it will take you more than four hours. Clearly, obviously. And if you tried to do that in four hours, you would do a really bad job of painting the house. And then if you get some little tiny apartment to paint, if it takes you four hours, then what is even going on there? Like, why is it taking so long? So just bring that common sense in here, too, because most of you guys in the chat box are giving me average times. And the one feature of this problem that should at least be pretty obvious is that this is not a problem of average length. I mean, there are a lot of words in this problem compared to your average animal on the GMAT. There's just so much stuff going on here. So 
There's more stuff than usual here. So it's okay to go well over the average. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, and in fact, again, we're going to shift away from the screen one more time for just a second. The most important thing you can know about timing actually has nothing to do with numbers or anything like that at all. Um, in fact, here's everything you really have to know about timing. You need to have two skill sets. You need to have two skills here, basically. Here's what they are. The first skill is you have to recognize and admit when you are stuck. I mean, there's a few frameworks in which you can think about this, but here is what I find to be the most like actionable or useful one, which is you have three questions in your head. Like if you if you have voices in your head actually good for this time because then they can ask you these questions all the time. The first question in your head should be, do you know exactly what you are doing or looking for? If it's a math problem, it's probably doing, and if it's a verbal problem, it's probably looking for. But do you know exactly why you are doing or looking for that? And is it honestly headed somewhere? Is it actually accomplishing anything? Um, the moment that these answers are not yes, yes, and yes, that is what stuck is. Like, stuck is not, oh my gosh, I'm total stalemate. There's nothing I can do here at all. Stuck is, I don't have an exact purpose for exactly what I am looking at or looking for. So, like, the, at the moment, the answers to these questions are not all yes. You are stuck. I mean, this is not the most fun admission to make, but you have to be very honest with yourself about this because that is how you manage this exam. I mean, there are a lot of problems and there's not like a ton of time. So the way you stay on track is to be super brutally honest with yourself about, oh my gosh, I'm stuck. And then the only other skill you really need here is when you are stuck, quit. That's it. I mean, it's really simple. It's weirdly simple, but you just have to have a lot of self-discipline in order to do this. And quit doesn't mean you necessarily have to leave the entire problem. It just means that you should quit the approach that you are specifically using at the time. But if you can think of another approach, then you should not leave the problem necessarily yet. You know, try it. And if you can't, then just guess and move on. So, there you go. I mean, this is actually, these two things are, are really, honestly, at the end of the day, these are every single thing that you actually have to know about timing. All the other stuff with timing charts and numbers and all the other kind of stuff, those things are those things are only necessary if you don't have the self discipline to do these two things. So in terms of in terms of Michael, your question here, again, I, I don't know this is another one of those questions that could mean a couple of different things. But I mean, one answer to this question is that there's a timer on the screen. I mean, I don't know how familiar you are with this test or not, but if you've never seen it before or whatever, then maybe you don't even know that. But the more important answer to this question is, I mean, so first answer is there's a timer on the screen. 
Okay, fine. The more important answer to this question is if you have the two skills mentioned up there, you you just won't have to worry about this. I promise you. I mean, the, the only time you will need any timing charts or the only time you will ever even have to think about average times or minutes or number of problems remaining and how much time, those, those are only things if you are not doing these two things. Otherwise, you will totally be fine. And I mean, this is not fun for most people because most people are not super great at quitting quickly. I mean, actually, a lot of people are, but the type of people who take this test are usually like, the, I'm going to keep working on this problem type, which is the worst thing that you can be here. I mean, this is the type of test where you should get the heck out of there if whatever you are doing is not immediately working. So be aware of that. Um, but that's pretty much what you have to know. I mean, there's a timer there, and there's lots of timing charts and stuff like that in our books in case you don't have these skills yet. But if you do, you don't need them. It's kind of cool. All right, so here's the problem. Let me give you a certain amount of time to look at it. How about that much time? Okay. Um, remember where the multiple choice answers are located, people. Um, they are located here. So that's where you'll find them. Okay, there's still a lot of people who don't have answers here, so let's make sure that we pick something. Again, the usual scolding here, this is the GMAT. So what that means is this is a test where you cannot not answer the problems. Like you have to actually pick something that is a thing. So Meaning if you are Vegeta or Robin or Eric or Rubio or JJ Swavely, you have to pick a thing here. Okay, so here are your responses to the, the question. I mean, we have a slight plurality in favor of C here, but definitely not a majority. So definitely some, some action here. All right, so last week's session, or last, last, the last session from two weeks ago was also on these boldface type of problems. So let's recap some of what was said in that session so that we can talk about it again here. Anybody here in the chat box, do any of you guys remember some of the main points that we made about these problems last time? Like, first, how should you read? When you read this passage, what sort of frame of mind should you read the passage in? Dialogue, yeah. Right? And when you think about this, you should also think about how you should not be reading these things because the way that you should absolutely not be reading these things is the way that, ironically, most people do. So, yeah, um, the, what you want to do is, Dan, if you weren't there, take a look at the things that people are, are saying above you there because that's, that's really where we're going with this. You, you want this to be like a normal conversation from planet Earth. So when we read these things, and I mean, this goes for pretty much all of critical reasoning in general. It's not just these problems. Unless you're looking at a problem where it's like, logically, which of these can you infer or prove? 
I mean, those problems are pretty rare, but if you're looking at one of those, then fine, it's not as conversational. But with all of the other critical reasoning problems, which is like 90% of everything, 95%, conversation is the way to go. So, like, when you read these, like, not just bold-faced, but CRs in general, You want to make it a dialogue because the thing is that people are really smart in conversations. Like people can follow things very, very, very well. In fact, um, random trivia here, but they, there's this you know there's a field called information science where they actually have numbers that measure like how complicated things are. Interesting to think of that, but there is a thing, right? And if you look at the complexity of, like, everyday gossip about people versus the complexity of advanced calculus, the gossip is actually more complicated. But the reason that people can follow it is that it is dialogue, and people are involved in it personally, and it's a thing. And, and that's what makes people much smarter about it. So make the passage into a dialogue in your head, like with a speaker who is actually a person. Because, I mean, just think about really trivial statements. Like, in, if I say, you know, if someone says, hey, Ron, your, your fly is down. You know, if you're in super academic mode, you're going to be like, oh, they are indicating the physical position of my zipper fly. With, I mean, fine, yeah, but not really. I mean, that's not really what they're doing. I mean, what they're doing is they're pointing out a problem with my clothes that I have to fix. And you're, you're going to realize that instantly if you're a person out there in the world, oh, hey, I better fix that. Whereas in an academic way of apprehending that, you'd be like, oh, they're indicating a physical position. It's such a huge difference, right? So what, what helps you here is if you actually name the speaker, I mean, this seems like something that's really stupid to do at first, but it's really not. Because, I mean, just if you want to see the value of this in action, like, just think about the difference between, you know, between asking what is the conclusion of the argument and... Why is Stephanie telling me this? What is her point? I mean, these are the same thing if you are, if you're thinking of this in perfectly logical terms, these are the same question, but they're not really the same question. Because this is something that seems to require a lot of analysis, and this really isn't. This is something that you kind of almost can't can't not understand when you have a conversation. So name the speaker, at least in your head, you should also convert these words into conversational language. So convert written language into conversational language, at least mentally. I mean, you probably don't want to do that on paper just because it would take kind of a long time to do that. But in your head, at least, you could do this. Because this is the true mark of understanding. Like, if you don't do this, it actually means that you are not understanding anything about what you read, is what it means. Because, I mean, when you understand things, you don't leave them in the terms that they are stated in. And, I mean, think about when you would read back word for word what's written in a book to somebody. I mean, if you were going to make fun of it, maybe, or if you just don't understand what it means. So, for instance, if you saw something like, you know, if the passage says carbon dating allows the accurate dating of ancient human artifacts. I mean, nobody talks like that. So if you read this, if you understand what this means, then in your head, at least, you should be telling yourself something like, hey, you know, this carbon dating thing is 
something that lets me figure out how old stuff is. I mean, this is what you see on paper, but this is understanding. And make sure that and if you if you make these the, the power of making these a conversation, aside from the fact that when you are socially involved in the passage, you'll understand it better, is that it, it when you imagine these things as dialogues, you ha you have to do this because obviously people will not speak in these kinds of words. Yeah, people don't say, "Hey, that plan is ill-conceived." Colon. I mean, people can't say things like that. So the power of making a dialogue, above all else, is that it forces you to actually like understand what the people are telling you and why, in a way that you will not and cannot do if you don't make it a, a conversation in your head. So just keep that in mind. This is the thing with all CR. This is not just a random bold-faced thing. So. Um, Convert it into written language, yeah, please do that. So let, let's do that here. Um, okay. So let's name the speaker. Um, someone give me a name for the speaker. Uh, you know, try to give me a name that's not too exotic or unique or whatever. All right, George works. Let's use George. I, I know a lot of people named George. Uh, cool. I'm sure we all know it, George. All right, George says, and I mean, you know, give us a context in your head. I mean, invent a story that surrounds this whole thing, right? So, like, George, I mean, George might be some sort of activist regarding this farming stuff, but George might also just be like, oh, dude, I read about this, this thing that people are trying to do in the newspaper, and it's just a terrible idea. So, but, okay. Um, George says uh, they, the, there's these orgs, they want to preserve the land. So what these orgs are trying to do is protect, let me make this font size a little smaller. What they are trying to do is protect that land from development. So, and, and I mean, whatever you need to rephrase to make this happen, make it happen, right? So what they are trying to do is prevent developers from getting their hands on this land. They don't want people to build on it. So protect this wilderness stuff, this wilderness area from becoming built up by developers. Okay. And then what their plan is, is they want to buy the land from the farmers. The, the environmental organizations want to. So their plan is to actually buy the land. And then George says, I think, notice this is what George thinks. If that seems obvious, then great. But the fact that this is what George thinks is definitely a thing here. So I think that this is a very bad plan. This is a bad plan. Okay. What is the colon? What does that mean? Like, if you were saying this, what would this colon turn into? Like, I mean, you can't, obviously, there's no colon if you're talking. So, what? what's there? If, if, what, what is, when George is actually giving you this whole spiel, what, how does that colon work? Yeah, like because. Because is a very good way to do that, Chloe. Yeah. I mean, explain further, right, that's what he's doing. And in terms of words, this colon would pretty much be a because or like here's why. Um, and if you literally imagine a George in front of you who is saying these things, you cannot get through this without 
converting the colon into like a here's why. So here's why I think this, or because, and then what does he say? Well, first of all, if they did sell it, it would go to developers and not to whom is the point, right? He's saying, he's saying if they did sell it, who, who's trying to buy it? At least according to this plan here. The plan is that, yeah, the plan is that the environmental organizations are going to, be careful, KT, careful with the, with the question, the specific question I'm asking here. The plan is that these organizations are trying to buy the land. So that specifically, so that who does not buy the land? So that the developers don't buy the land. Yeah, right? So, but then George is like, dude, if you sell it, the developers have a lot more money than nonprofit organizations do. So let's be serious here. The developers are going to win. So, first of all, if, if there is a buyer, like, I mean, George is basically saying the EOs won't be able to buy these things. I mean, they won't, they won't be able to buy the land anyway, even if they want to, because the developers have more money, they'll bid higher. And then also, they probably won't sell it anyway if it if it is farmable land. So besides this is like another reason. Besides, let's be serious here. The farmers aren't going to sell it in the first place. Because it's their land, is it's where they grow stuff. I mean how are they going to make a living if they sell their farmland? So these are two reasons why George thinks this plan will not be something that will work. Um, so, but where is he going with this? Where is he going with farming will not remain viable if the farms are left unmodernized? Because, I mean, here's the way you should kind of think about the, I mean, George is saying there's basically two plans, which are, you know, the farmers are either not that this is a huge stroke of genius or anything, but the farmers are either going to sell the land or they're going to not sell the land. I mean, which one of these does George regard as a better outcome? He regards not sell as a better outcome because if you sell it, the evil developer people are going to buy it, right? So, George, at least in terms of this goal here, um, that's in the first line, in terms of that goal, the outcome that we want is, of course, not sell. I mean, we, we want this to happen because if we sell it, the buyers, the developers are going to buy it and build things on it. So. And then, so he's going into, like, the only way you're going to accomplish this, because if you sell, then this will not preserve the land, is, is where he's going with it. Like, if you sell, that's it, man. That land is gone. You won't preserve the land, because developers will build on it. So the only way to accomplish this goal is to make farming viable. Because if it's not viable, again, they will sell it. So, and that is, so he goes into, aha. So let's, so let's, well, how would he say this in a conversation? Well, if we want to preserve the land, which is what the, environmental organizations are saying is their goal in the first place. Then we've got to keep farming viable.
So my plan, says George, at least the plan that I think would work, would be blah, 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 last thing is in the last line. So um, according to me, a plan that might actually work for accomplishing this goal is x, 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 blah, 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 blah. Right. So there you go. Okay. I mean, this is something that should happen in your head as you read this passage. Now, notice that what this is specifically not doing. Um, this is not, oh my gosh, formal analysis, premise, conclusion, blah, 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 blah. I mean, that's in there. I mean, that stuff is there. But, I mean, when it comes to bold-faced problems, there's two things you should understand about classifying statements like that. I mean, the first is that it will, and let's go ahead and take this stuff to the next page. And then you'll, um, this page is now full. So, new page. There's the problem again. It still killed the answer choices. And then here's your, here's what the, here's what George is saying. Um, as far as classifying the statements goes, so first let's talk about why that's mentioned in the materials, and then let's talk about what you should do or not do about it. So as far as classifying the statements goes, do you want to do that? Well, as a primary plan, absolutely not. Don't do it. Because, I mean, if you think about it, like, tell me, okay, um, th these things are the what here, basically. These things on the left-hand side. These are what George is saying. So now let's talk about the why over there in the right-hand side. And let's be as specific as we can about this. So why is George saying each of these things? So what, why is George saying this? I mean, be as specific as you can here, and don't feel like you have to respond in terms of classifications that are in the curriculum. I mean, just, just tell me in plain old conversational terms why George is saying this stuff. Um, in, in this line, in this, this line only right now. So we're not, I mean, eventually, Imanji and CYU too, eventually, yes, he goes there, but he's not going there right now. Why is this statement? Yeah, it's an intro. We're getting warmer, right? It's, it's, it is a background type of thing. But the, the point is that you can do better than just saying that it's a background statement. It's not, you know, you can't, you don't have to stop. There, you don't have to stop with it's a background statement. I mean, you can totally, um, you can totally get more than that out of it. So th this is this is the goal of the whole thing. Like this is the this is the single thing that we are talking about accomplishing. We are trying to accomplish it. It's, it's a goal, right? I mean, it's stated as background, but you can do better than just saying it's background. What is that? This is the, uh, yeah, you got, see, what you guys are doing is you're still giving me the whole passage here, which is good in the sense that you, like, get it. Like, it's good in the you know what's going on here, and you can tell heads from tails kind of sense. But, it, I mean, make sure you can say what each of the statements is doing. Like, their plan, I mean, let's see if we can do better than Rakesh, see if we can do better than that. Um, this is the actual plan. But why is George telling us this plan? 
it, it's the plan that he thinks it's a bad plan. Yeah, right? That's why the reason George is telling us what the existing plan is is to say that he thinks that it's a bad plan. Right? This is how the organizations think they want to achieve that goal. And just as importantly, and make sure that you are not ne neglecting this part, that's not all that it is. I mean, again, if I'm telling you your fly is down, it doesn't just mean the physical position of your zipper is down. It means, dude, you're supposed to zip that up. You have to fix it. So just as importantly, this is how the orgs think they want to achieve the goal, but George thinks that this is a bad or non-viable plan. George does not think this plan will work. Okay. Make sure you get that. So now I think this is a bad plan. George says this is a bad plan. Why does George think that? So this is his what. I mean, again, be as specific as you can here. Do not just say it is the conclusion. Try to do better than that. It's, a, it's George's opinion about what. Yeah, mind you, no, the, I mean the statement right now with this, just just this statement right here. So it's not support for the argument because that's actually the whole central point. It's not support, but. Um, see, okay, be careful with things like just evaluation or stuff like that. You can do better than that. I mean, it's, th this is his, and Chloe is right, but Chloe, you're kind of just telling me what the statement says again and not the why. Um, the reasons why it's a bad plan come later. I mean, this is what I'm looking for. Maybe you guys are thinking I'm looking for more than I'm looking for here. But if I ask you why is George saying this is a bad plan? This is George's opinion about the specific plan at hand. I mean, notice that it is not his opinion about the goal, right? It, that's, that's why it's better to get specific like this. Because if you're just like, la, 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 it's his conclusion or his evaluation, and you're not saying his evaluation of what, then that, that's a problem, right? So here are his reasons. Now, these are his reasons, right? These are why he has the opinion he has. These are the reasons why George has this opinion. And then we've got this thing. What's the point of keeping farming viable? Like, that's not the main goal here, but it's something you have to achieve. Why? This is not the main goal. But, according to George, this is something that must happen to get there. So this is the only way that George thinks we are going to accomplish the goal. Or at least the only way he mentions. This is this is how George thinks we can accomplish the goal. So, I mean, this is what you want to try to do. Like, when you, your primary objective when you do these gold based thingies is this. I mean, you, you want to go for what we have in green here. 
not classifying things. You want to just make it a dialogue and make sure you understand why everything George is saying is being said. Like, why is he actually saying all the things that he is saying? This is the goal. So as a primary plan, you don't want to be classifying like crazy because you just don't. I mean, number one, you don't have to. It, it, it moves you away from the dialogue. It moves you away from the conversational frame of mind, which is an absolute necessity. The frame of mind is. Uh, let me rephrase that so that it's more clear what I'm saying. So that is, that is necessary to solve the problem. There. to understand the passage. And then on top of that, the other thing that it does is that it's way too vague, right? You you just, it, it's, it's too vague. It's much more vague than what you can come up with. Think about the difference between this is George's conclusion and this is his opinion about the specific plan for accomplishing this goal. I mean, which one of these is better? It's not the classifying one. So the reason why the classifying is there is as a backup plan. As a backup plan, if you are thoroughly lost, Um, in the word, sure, but not as a primary plan. And I mean, really, realistically, guys, make sure you know what this whole critical reasoning section is doing. I mean, this whole section of the test is meant to be stuff that, honestly, if you just walk in there and think about them like you would in the real world, you can get them right. It's actually what this portion of the test is. It is specifically something that you don't really have to study a lot for. So keep that in mind, because all the stuff in the books is mostly structure that you that will help you if you are lost or confused, but that you don't need if you're not lost or confused. I mean, guys, if you are not lost or confused on critical reasoning problems, you should just be able to read the word and answer the problem without thinking about any sort of problem type, classification, rules, blah, 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 blah. That's, that's the point of these problems. You're, you're talking to a dude named George, and you are understanding why he is saying things. I mean, you don't have to prep for that. So the structure in, like, the things like classifying stuff and, and, and all the note taking and whatever, that helps if you get lost. Those can be very helpful things if you get lost. If you don't get lost, they are honestly not really that useful. So just keep that in mind. And then we had a user who asked, um, would you take notes on this kind of thing? In CR in general, the default should be not take notes. But if you get lost, then go ahead and take some notes to see if you can get unlocked. So, and that ties in with what's going on here, like as long as you, I, I mean, there's a couple of ways I can answer this, so let me just give the sort of long-winded answer to this. In, in general, don't take notes on CR um, as a default. In general, the default should be not to take notes on CR. But if you get lost, I mean, there's two reasons why you might want to take notes. You should take notes under two conditions. The first condition is you get lost or confused, in which case notes might orient you. The other, the other condition would be if you are writing down an exact prediction of what the answer should be. So on bold face, if you're doing this, the, the most compelling reason I can think of to take notes in this kind of situation 
would be if you are writing down absolutely precisely what you think is going to be the answer to this problem in terms of the bold phase and stuff. So here, um, I mean, if you get lost, that's more of an individual thing. If you are lost, of course, you should try writing down something. But the two bold phases in the problem are this one and this one. So you might want to write down in your notes this and this. It's his opinion is the first one about how they want to accomplish the goal. It's, he's not saying the goal is bad. He's saying the way they want to go about it, accomplishing it is bad. So, and then what he's doing here is he's giving an alternative plan for accomplishing the same goal. So, we can be so much more specific. It, it's kind of neat how much more specific we can be here. So, just be more specific people, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so, all right, let's capture those and take them over to the next page, because the two things that we really want at the end of the day are that and that. So now let's talk about dealing with answer choices. Uh, you know, the statements, do you mean? Well, the classifying is the why, not the what. I mean, if you... Like, for example, if something is a conclusion, that's not an inherent property of the statement itself. It, it, it's the why. But the, the problem with the classification is that they're still really broad. I mean, they, they have to be because, remember, we're trying to give categories that, like, every single argument in the world will fall into. So needless to say, you can't really get as specific as you can with specific arguments. So, I mean, no, the classification, if you're doing it right, the classifications are still the why and not the what, but they're just not as good. I mean, think about the difference between this is the conclusion, which is true but really vague, and this is George's specific opinion about a plan for achieving a certain goal. Okay, that's much better. So, I hope that helps. So let's talk about this in terms of the answer choices now. But okay, one more question before we start looking at choices. Do you need the answer choices to answer this question? What do you think, chat box? Do you, on bold face questions, do you need the answer choices? I are getting a couple of yeses. I mean, okay, it depends on what you mean when you say yes. I mean, if yes means I have to pick a choice to answer the problem because it's the GMAT, then yes, that's correct. But if yes means I actually have to go through A, B, C, D, E to decide what the answer to this question is, then no, very, very bad idea. Because, I mean, the point is that you don't need them. I mean, if you have a conversation in your head with George, you should understand already. Um, ideally, you should already understand exactly why George is making these statements. So what you should do is just temporarily cover the answer choices up, predict what they're going to say, which, this is the hard part, by the way, predicting what the answer choice is going to say, because the answer choice will not talk about George. So what you have to do in this case is you have to translate back from George language into, like, stupid academic sounding language. So you have to translate back from George or dialogue to weirdo language. So let's do that. Here's, here's what we came up with for those two bold faces. The first bold face is this. The 
the second bold phase is this. And one thing that is going to be very consistent here is that the argument is George. That the primary advantage of having done this is that anything that George thinks is what the argument supports and anything that George does not think is, is counter to the argument. So the argument equals George. So this is normal person language. What we need to do at this point before we look at the choices that's very important is normal people language. We need to convert this back into weirdo answer choice language. So let's do that. Can anybody convert this into answer choice language? And Dan says, in the chat box, Dan says I have more problems understanding the choices. Believe me, man, I do too. I mean, on top of all of this, I'm also dyslexic. So as you imagine, these answer choices are not really my friend. But the thing is, if you do this, you won't have to do, you won't have to swim through all the answer choices because you will have an exact thing that you are looking for. So, um, King, you got to do better than that, man. You got you to do better than conclusion of the argument. I mean, again, King, you are not wrong, but the whole point of conversationalizing this is that you can do so much better than just saying it's the conclusion. You can actually, like, say specifically what kind of conclusion it is. Because, I mean, in this case, it's an opinion about a particular plan for achieving a goal. It's not just a random conclusion. So just try to be See why you two at Binghamton know it's not the goal. This this is not the goal. It's not. I mean, the goal is actually that first thing. This is, and, and it is not an assessment of the goal. That is very specifically what it is not. Be very careful about that. Um, because what the goal is, what what's the goal? Yeah, the goal is not what the orgs are trying to do. The goal is to preserve the land, which George thinks is a perfectly fine and noble goal. I mean, George has no issues with the goal. George has issues with how they want to get there, but not with the goal itself. And I mean, this is the advantage of... Because, in, see, here's the difference between a conversation and not a conversation. In a conversation, I mean, okay, obvious is a dangerous word. I know it's one of those words that can insult people if it's not true. But in a conversation, I would dare say that this that it is obvious that this is wrong. Whereas in an academic problem, it's not obvious. Like, if you are talking to George, you know, like, okay, what are they trying to accomplish? Well, they're trying to preserve the land. I mean, this would be like saying George is passing judgment on what they are trying to accomplish, which you would know is false. It's totally not true. Like, George is not judging the goal of the action. George is judging the means. He's judging how you are trying to get to the goal. So, um, let's be as specific as we can with, with this sort of thing. I mean, you want to come up with something like, you know, like the, it is, it, it's, it's George's opinion on like a, a method or a way. Of, so it is an assessment. I'll steal that word from some of you guys. It's an assessment of one particular method for achieving a goal. Note that the goal itself is not assessed. Uh, 
you know, it's, it's, I mean, again, just make this the right kind of conversation and all these differences will be super, super clear. Like, let's say that someone is like, dude, I want to lose 10 pounds. I'm going to do it by not eating anything for a week. Okay. Um, <laughs> if their friend is like, dude, that's a bad way to go about losing 10 pounds. Like, think about what just happened there. I mean, are we judging the goal of wanting to lose 10 pounds? No, of course we're not. I mean, that's not what's going on there. It's like, fine, whatever, man, if you want to lose weight, good. But what we're judging there negatively is like, that's a bad way of doing that. It's not the goal is bad. It's the way that you're trying to accomplish it is, is terrible. So, right? It, it, but it's not, notice it's a horrible way to lose weight that way. It's not a horrible goal to want to lose weight in the first place. You, you see what the difference is. And, and that's, the reason why that example is easier is because it is conversational. Let that sink in. The reason why the example I just gave you is so easy to understand is because it is not academic. That's the secret. That's what critical reasoning is. That's why it's on the exam, because the more academic you are about it, the worse you will get. Let me say that again. The more you think of these as academic problems, the worse you will be at them. Whoa, how about that? That's why it's on the exam. I mean, that is not a random cute fact. That is the purpose of putting CR on the test. So just make sure you know that's the thing with this stuff. Okay, this is the second bold face is what, this is another method, which is advocated this time by George, where George is the argument. for achieving the same goal. Okay, that's what this is. And again, you, the problem with the classifications is that they are just not as good. I mean, this is so much better than just saying it's a completion. And when you look at the answer choices, you'll see why, right? Okay, here's the answer choices. So, I mean, the problem with just saying that it's the main conclusion is that it could, you're not really eliminating any of these choices if you say that. But if you say this is an assessment of one particular way of achieving this goal, well, does it assess the goal? No, it, it doesn't assess the goal. The goal is whatever, man. Like if I say starving yourself for a week is a bad way to lose 10 pounds, I'm not saying the goal of losing 10 pounds is bad. I'm not judging it one way or the other. I'm saying the way you want to get there. So these two are bad. We, we don't want those. Those are, those are bad news bears. Um, what about the, this one? The first is the conclusion reached about one strategy. Oh my gosh, that is almost exactly what we said. That's pretty sweet. Um, and then main conclusion, is, is this the main conclusion? It's not, and like in conversation, the best way to think about this is could George, stop talking after saying this statement? And the answer is no, he can't because he, and I mean, this is the problem with this kind of argument is that you don't really have one thing which is like, you know, this is totally the main conclusion of the whole thingy. Because this is not, this is not just a set of statements aimed at proving one conclusion. I mean, this is, there's a whole host of stuff going on here that doesn't neatly get captured by the simple premise, conclusion, blah, blah, blah type of model, but that doesn't really seem very complicated if you are talking with George. So it, it's not a main conclusion because it's not, you can't, he's not done by the time he says this. Like he has to go on and be like, okay, well, their plan sucks, so here's a better plan. So it's not the end point of the reasoning. So these are also wrong. 
So we're done. It's got to be C, but let's make sure we look at the second bold face. Um, the second bold face says, and I mean, you will notice this will happen, by the way, a lot. This will happen a lot of the time, which this meaning, if you have an exact enough prediction, you will only even have to look at one of the two bold faces. I mean, this, this is not rare. So if you um, consider the second bold face, let's see how well we can do with that one. It's another method that the argument thinks will achieve the same goal. So this is wrong because George is not giving another goal. He's just giving another way to achieve the same goal, so double X. Um, the strategy that the reasoning concludes has the best chance of reaching the goal. This is this is not wrong. This seems pretty good. Um, this also seems pretty good. These are not saying exactly the same thing, but they're both, you can support both of these, right? This is how George thinks you're most likely going to get there. That's definitely true, right? Because he thinks all the other plans are not going to work at all. And then this is, of course, the plan that he is advocating for. Um, the sensible but for which no support is offered, that's not true because the whole idea that you have to keep farming viable is support for that. And then it is, this is not, this is not raised to support the earlier statement. Like this is later. So it, this is not a reason why the original plan is bad. This is a supplemental plan that we will use instead. How about that? So, I mean, notice that with the exception of the second bold in choice B, you can use either bold face. And if you are exact enough here, you can finish the problem. It's kind of neat. Any questions about what's going on here? Okay, cool. Let's do one more of these things. And I mean, you know, we've just spent, what, like an hour talking about one problem, and that's kind of a good thing. Because what that means, if you spend an hour talking about one problem, is that you are really kind of getting to stuff that matters, you know, where you're generalizing about that type of problem in the first place and about, if you spend an hour, n not nitpicking, like if you spend an hour debating over what one sentence means, then of course that's bad. But if you spend an hour thinking about what kind of thought processes are actually involved here or what has to go on in my head to let me, or, you know, judging whether you should do certain things, um, you know, yeah. I mean, in fact, ironically, I could take the, what we have just been saying and make it into this exact structure. Like, some students think they want to do better at C. Okay, students want to do better at critical reasoning. A lot of students think in order to do that, they have to take all the notes in the world. But hey, that's a bad idea. Because if you take all the notes in the world, you're, you're going to, like, try to classify things, and you're going to write down a lot of things that are unnecessary. Instead, you should, you know, our brains are better because we're social animals. Our brains are better at thinking about conversation. And that is exactly why a more sensible thing to do in critical reasoning is talk to a George in your head and make this a conversation. Well, look at that. Same argument. That's kind of neat. So... The goal is to do better on critical reasoning. We are obviously not judging that. I mean, again, obvious, I know obvious is a dangerous word, but I think it's kind of obvious that we are not passing judgment on the you want to do better at CR thing. We're passing judgment on the whole idea of taking notes every single time, all the time. And then we're giving a better way of thinking about it. So if that's more clear than this argument, it's because that one is a thing in which you are personally involved, and this one is not. And that's, that's what the difference is. So, good stuff. Um, let's look at another one. How about that? So, remember where you find multiple choice answers, ladies and gentlemen. 
You find them there. That's where you find them. Okay, go for it. Okay, I realize my mic was off. Um, just to sort of help you out and or to sort of annoy you if you're trying to do this the wrong way, uh, I got rid of the choices. I gone them. So I'll put them back when there's about 20 seconds left. There's your friends, the answer choices. So try to pick one of those in the next like 20 seconds or so. If you can, please. All right, we we need to get something on on. You gotta pick a thing that is a thing here. So if you have to guess, then guess. Remember, you gotta pick something. Okay, um, I'm looking at you, Ramiro, Vidita, Natasha, um, especially Vidita. I know you're here because you've been typing a lot of things. Okay, there we go. Um, Howard, Natasha, yeah, let's pick a thing. Okay, so this one I don't think you guys had as hard of a time with because, well, um, there's, a, there's actually a pretty strong majority here. So but let's talk about it anyway. Um, because not everybody picked it. So let's make sure we're on the same page here. Who's talking? Give me a name. Brian. All right. Brian is the historian who is talking. Let's use that. So Brian says... And again, just making it Brian says is such a potent weapon. It's actually kind of weird just how potent of a weapon it is. So Brian says that they did these censuses back then, and like we have a lot of records from the 1600s. Like we, we they're remarkably complete, meaning you know they've survived. You know the records are we still have like uh, basically all of them. So we have a lot of census record data from the 1600s. I mean, because the, the thing with complete is, I mean, it could even mean one of two things. I mean, it could mean that they complete in the sense of back in the day they collected a ton of data kind of complete or it could mean complete as in like these records have made it to the present day without being destroyed and I mean what's cool is that the point is the same either way the point is that we have a lot of records so you don't, you don't even have to nitpick which kind of complete we're talking about because either way the upshot is we have a lot of these records we have just lots and lots of them so, um, okay, and then make sure you understand statements like this. The point here is that because we have, I mean, Brian's going to make a point, you know, eventually, but what I'm going to say is even more remarkable because we have so many data. 
So that's what Brian is doing there. It, it's like, you know, if we surveyed five people about something and we got crazy, crazy results, then oh, well, we only surveyed five people. So if we asked five Americans who's the president of the United States and they all said Mickey Mouse, that would be sort of weird. On the other hand, if we asked a million Americans who is the president and they said Mickey Mouse, that would be a lot weirder. That's kind of where Brian is going with this, right? Like the fact that there are so many records and so many data points makes what I'm going to say even weirder. Um, okay, so fun fact. is that there were five times when, according to the census records, like all the people suddenly died, like the population shrunk hugely, like people magically died or disappeared. And, of course, if you look at the records, I mean, but if you look at the historical context here, you'll see that, that all of those, like, magic death plagues, which, you know, Brian doesn't think they really were death plagues, um, came after tax increases. Aha, uh -huh. how about that? So, they, they, when the tax was based on population, right? So, the tax was population based, based on number of people. So, when the tax went up, there was an obvious incentive to pretend that the population went down. And so that's what they did. Um, so that's the, and, and it would have been easy to do it. Okay. So that means that the magic death plagues were probably fake. Those people almost certainly did not die or disappear. The census was just making things up. The census was just cooking the book, as they say. Okay. Um, this is what Brian is doing, and I mean, just to, let's make sure that we know what the two bold faces are, but let's just go ahead and talk about why Brian is saying all the things. So, um, what is the point of we have a lot of census data from the, from the 1600s? I mean, this is a fact. This is not anyone's opinion or anything like that. This is factually people, we have like lots of data. But why, why are we saying that? It's a context, but why, what's the importance of it? See, I mean, again, people are just saying background. I mean, you may get sick of hearing me say this, but you can do better than that, people. You can do better than just saying it's background. It's, it, it, like, what's the difference between surveying, like, five people and getting a weird-ass result and getting, like, you know, a million, a weirdo result and surveying, like, a million people are getting a weirdo result. It's the Mickey Mouse point, meaning, yeah, right? It, it's, it's the fact that you surveyed a million people means that, wow, Americans really think Mickey Mouse is president. Whoa, how crazy. It, it makes it more emphatic, right? So this is, this is just a fact, but the purpose of it is not just to be a random background fact. Like, this is a background fact that makes Brian's evidence that much more solid is what it does. I mean, th this fact doesn't really necessarily seem surprising. I mean, what, what, so someone is saying surprising. Not really. I mean, Brian doesn't find it surprising that we have lots of data. Like, Brian finds other things surprising, but not this. Okay. Um,
there's that actually that that that's that's yeah background fact and what brian is saying in this in this very completeness makes one point stand out is he's saying that so this this part is really just this half of what we already wrote. Okay, so we're good there. Now, fun fact, there were five times when, um, you don't have to do this, this is not a bold face, but let's make sure you can do it anyway, because I certainly could make this a bold face. What is that? Not what, but why? Why is Brian telling us this? This is a what? It's an interesting observation, King. I like that. Now, dot, dot, dot. Let's fill in the dot, dot, dot part. Um, true, but where is Brian going with it? It is something that is unusual, but that's still just what it is. That's not why Brian is telling us this. Because you're king in one sense, you're or Michael. You're still telling me that the fly, yet your fly is down, is like oh, your zipper is physically located down. It's it's a weird, but it is okay. It's a weird discovery. Sure, let's get that down. And then, what is Brian trying to do with it? Brian is trying to. That's how he does it. Someone is trying to hide the number of people. But the Brian is trying to, again, don't don't run all the way out of the stadium with this ball. I'm looking for something pretty basic here. But the Brian is trying to explain. That's the point of what Brian is doing, is, is you know, or evaluate or, like, assess. In terms of, is it, we're not explaining why the completeness is unusual. The completeness is just a thing. Like if I survey a million people and they say the president is Mickey Mouse, the the surveying of a million people is not weird. It, it's what the people are saying that is weird. So Chloe, not really. Like if you, the thing that is unusual is the fact that the, apparently everybody died five times, not, not the completeness of the data. Make sure you're on that page. Okay. So, and then if they do this, then, I mean, Brian is here. This is like, here's other history. More evidence that helps us, like, shed light on the situation. So, this is extra evidence that sheds additional light on the situation. And so is this. This is more of that evidence. Okay. Now what about this one? What about, what about, what color have I not used red? When the tax went up. What, what is that? Is this a fact or is this something that Brian is like concluding or claiming? Michael, the short answer to your second question is no. Um, level of the question is never something you should worry about, so I don't really want to go there. But long does not mean hard. Um, yeah, it is, it's an explanation. It's not a fact. It's his claim of, well, duh, they had this incentive. It might seem obvious, but it's not a fact. It's not like data. It's just what he is claiming really sort of is, is the incentive. So this is, this is a claim Brian makes. Um, 
makes this claim as grounds for what? What a couple of you guys are already saying. As grounds for his own what? You see if you can do better than conclusion. I mean, again, conclusion is one of those dastardly vague words, right? His theory, yeah, Vedita, I like that. His theory that explains what really was happening, yeah, right? Because what he really thinks was going on was this, this last thing. But that thing before that is his rationale as to why. So. And again, if you're talking to Brian, it's actually going to be hard for you to not understand this because that's what conversation is. I mean, you're, you're on the same page. So, and here's what he thinks. This is what he thinks. Really did or didn't happen. So, okay, there. So the things that are actually bold faces in this problem are this one and this one. So that's what we want to go with. But it's good to do it with the others just as practice. I mean, under timing conditions, you're clearly not going to do this with all the statements, but it's good practice. So here's the choices. So this one's sort of weak, but let's not kill it just yet. I mean, it's not really support. It's more like a background fact that, like, the fact that we surveyed a million people doesn't directly support the idea that their opinion is weird, but it does help to substantiate, in general, the things that we're saying. So we can, let's not reject that just yet. Um, it provides a context for a certain evidence that that is almost exactly what we said. It's a background fact about Brian's evidence. So this is this is big smiley face right here. Um, this is number one. It's not a position. It's a fact. Facts are not positions, right? Positions have to be opinions that need support. So that's the first thing bad about this one. And then the second is that you are not seeking to establish this. Like, Brian makes absolutely no effort to explain or, or prove that the, that the records are complete. He just says that they are. So this is also not a thing. Okay, this one, this is not an assumption. This is a historical fact. So that's, that's not true. And then it's definitely not, it's not a claim, it's a fact. So that's individually wrong. And then, of course, Brian does not reject it. Brian actually says, because this is true, it gives more weight to what I'm saying. So we're down to two. Um, let's talk about this question in the box here for a moment. I know we're sort of over time here, but we're going to finish here in a moment. Um, I mean, this is, the way I'm going to answer this is going to sound, you know, again, sort of annoyingly simple, like most of the things that I'm saying here. But this is not any sort of awesome educational technique thing. This is really just, you know, in general, you should try to do the same type of thing at the same time. I mean, you know, imagine you're making sandwiches. If you have to make 20 sandwiches, think how much more time it will take you and how much harder it will be if you make each sandwich completely before you start making the next one. I mean, think how much faster you will be if you, like, do all the bread, and then you do all the sauce, and then you do all the meat for all 20. I mean, it'll be much faster, because you are doing the same thing over and over again. That's what's cool about it. You don't have to shift your mental frame. So that's really what the point is. I mean, this is a very, very general thing, by the way. Um, 
this applies to the math section too. But if there's anything, if there's any situations where you have to like do the same task, then try to do it at the same time. Because otherwise, we're going to have to keep flip flopping between. I mean, why would we want to do that to ourselves, people? I mean, let's be serious. So yeah, I mean, as a very general way of thinking, try to do the same thing at once. It will help. Um, okay. Let's look at the other one. So the other one is if the tax went up, there was a. So his is a claim that he makes as grounds for his own explanation. Um, judgment means claim. Advanced support means cited as grounds for. And this is what he thinks happened. So this is precisely what we want. So we have a winner. Um, the other choices. It doesn't argue against. I mean, it it it's definitely. Brian's pro his own position type of thing. So that's not correct. And then um, the second is evidence, again, used to argue against, hardly. Double X. And then the second is the position it's not. The, the, the position itself is the last statement, the thing about how uh, the census records were just lies. So this is still a reason. Um, and then there's, there, there's no rejection, so this is also not a thing. So, there you go. Winner, um, choice B. OK, so that's it. Um, we're over time here, so we definitely have to have to kill it. But thank you for attending, and um, you know, hopefully you'll walk away from this with a little bit more general general context about how to think about these things, and not just like I mean, as as parting words, if you walk away from this thinking you have like ten more rules for boldface problems, that's bad. That's not what you should walk away from this with. What you should walk away from this with is like, here is a way that I'm going to think about these that seems sort of weird for a test. I mean, you know, obviously having conversations is not weird, but thinking of a test question in that sort of way is for a lot of people. And so that's the point, right? The point is to sort of shift your mental frame work here. So, all right, let's kill it. If you have any admin questions, uh, feel free super quickly. we got to shut down and move on here. But um, if you have admin questions, feel free to throw those up there. And if not, then good night and good luck. And I believe the next study hall is just in two weeks again. So whatever date is two weeks from now. Okay. Um, topics I don't really decide until the day of the session, so I mean, there's no way for me to really answer that question in advance. Um, all right, so I'm going to kill the recording at this point.